the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When the wise men had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there till I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord has spoken to the prophet. Out of Egypt have I called my son. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Achelous reigned over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that, that what was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. The Gospel of the Lord. We have a brief moment of questions. Question number one. As we celebrate Mary, Queen of Nigeria, and seek her intercession for our country, our alien country, what would the mother of Jesus be saying? What will she be saying, one, to Nigerian leaders, and B, to Nigerian citizens? You recall at Cana in Galilee, when Mary saw that they had run out of wine, she turned to Jesus and said they have no wine, pleading that Jesus does something about it. Then, after speaking to Jesus, what did she do? She turned to the disciples and said what? Do whatever he tells you. So, in our Nigerian circumstance, what do you think, after turning to Jesus to ask to pray for Nigeria, what do you think she will turn to us to say? One, to our leaders, and two, to our citizens. There's a brief answer that I want. Question two, list the qualities of godly leadership found in today's readings. There are a number of qualities of godly leadership in the first reading, in the second reading, in the third reading, uh, I mean in the responsorial psalm, and in the gospel. What are those qualities of godly leadership? Question three. What does the Bible teach us? Our Judeo-Christian scriptures. What does it teach us about the impact of leadership integrity on the one hand and the impact of leadership debauchery on the other, on the fortunes of a nation. The Bible is full of lessons on the impact of in leadership integrity on a nation or the impact of leadership debauchery on a nation. Any examples? The Bible is full of examples. Question four. St. Paul says that Christ has broken down the wall of division between races and ethnic groups and clans and tribes, if there are still tribes. And he has made us into one family. Some translations say into one household, one kinship of God. So why are poisonous ethnic sentiments still so pervasive? among us Nigerian Christians, after Christ has made us into one 
household. And some of you will remember the late Archbishop Albert Obefuna, who at the first African Synod, first Synod of Bishops for Africa in 1994, made that fantastic uh, claim about Af the church is the family of God. And wondered whether we consider the water of our baptism, whether it is thicker than the blood of our tribes. The lament is that often the blood of our tribes is thicker than the water of baptism. And I would add that we are mistaken because we have not just been saved by water, we have been saved by the blood of Christ. Is the blood of Christ in which we have been baptized, is the blood of Christ that we take in communion, is that blood thicker than the blood of our tribes? That's a serious question which we all deal with. And what will you do about it? Yes, um, uh, Jacob. Glory to Jesus. I want to attempt question one. To Nigeria leaders. I mean leaders at all levels. Yes. The, the queen of Nigeria, our mother Mary, we advise them. She will, she will say to them that even though you led my people over the years astray, and at the ver this very moment you are still leading them astray, there is still room for improvement. Lead my people right. Let my people breathe. Let my people breathe. Then to the citizens, of course. Uh, Mother Mary will advise us as citizens of this country, this great country, that you should obey the civic, the, the civic rules, the just laws. Do the right thing. Of course, let's break it down to obey at least, at the very least, the traffic light. So Mary is interested in how we obey traffic light too. Which, yes, because that, that's the beginning now. That's, that's the beginning. beginning. At least let's start from the, the minimum, the very minimum. Obey the traffic light, and do the right thing at all times. So we pray today that our Mother Mary will intercede for us and make our country better. Thank you. That's yes, right. A round of applause for him. Among those to obey traffic light are policemen. Is it? Policemen and women should be among those to obey traffic light, isn't it? Uh, all those who are doing pilot vehicle for big people, they should obey traffic. Praise the Lord. I'd like to attempt question two. These are the qualities of godly leadership found in today's reading. There are so many. One of them is that a good leader has the wisdom of God. Has, wisdom of God, yes. Yes, has understanding. He has right judgment, is impartial, is compassionate, is courageous because he has the spirit of might. And then one fundamental quality is that he has the fear of the Lord. He deals with equity with everyone. He it has means pity. that a good leader has the gifts of the Holy Spirit yes. as listed in today's first reading. Because leadership is, it comes from God. And if you are a leader without having those gifts, then you may just be a pretender. Yes. Give a round of applause. Yes. Yes, Gregory. I'll attempt a question three. Yes. The Bible teaches us in Proverbs 29, 2. Proverbs when, 29, 2. Yes, that when the righteous rule, people rejoice. When the righteous are in authority, yes. People rejoice. The Proverbs makes a distinction between authority and rule. Yes, yes, authority. When the righteous are in the authority, the people rejoice. Yes, sir. Then? When the wicked rule. rule. When the wicked rule, the, the people, people groan. Born. It is not for nothing that that distinction is made. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. The people wail. The people cannot breathe. Give him a round of applause. Question four now. Question four. Yes, Manuel. Glory to Jesus. Not to Mary. Okay. Uh, St. Paul says that Christ has broken down the wall of division between races and ethnicities. 
the groups and made us into one family of God. Why are Muslims remain still pervasive among Christians? And what will I do about it? But I think that the ethnic sentiment is still pervasive among Nigerian Christians because we have failed to live according to the tenets of our Christian belief. Christ, as the question said, has broken down everything and given us one common baptism. And as a people, we have failed to recognize the kingship, the various attributes of a Christian, of a follower of Christ that Christ has established for us. Rather, we have held in the, to the tenets of our et various ethnic groups. What Christ showed us and, advise, and asked us to abide with is love, compassion, goodness, righteousness. But in Nigeria, various Christian groups and Christians have held on to our own ethnic affiliation. So we have not embraced the Christian ethos. We have so, not ex embraced Christian values. Yes, sir. We are worshipping with our lips, but our hearts are far away, unfortunately. And it is something that we all... What will you do about it? What I will do and have been doing is to recognize every Nigerian and every human being, in short, as a brother in Christ as a child of God, and relate with my Christian values with every Nigerian and every human being. I was quite um, fascinated yesterday. I was having an interview on independence with um, Chief uh, Senator Ben Obi. And as we were reminiscing on politics in Nigeria and from the first to the second republic and so on, the admiration with which he spoke of um, Uncle Waziri Ibrahim, the chairman of GNPP, some of you remember, the admiration with which he spoke about him, the admiration with which he spoke about uh, Tundij Braithwaite and so on across, showed that in the kind of politics that he was involved in in the early days, there was, that is both before the war and even after the war, there was this understanding that we are one country. I mean, uh, he spoke severally. I mean, those of you who will watch the program, you will see the number of times he called Uncle Waziri Ibrahim. You remember that guy who practiced politics without bitterness? He was politics without bitterness. He promoted politics without bitterness. And, and um, so when I was speaking to Senator Ben Obi, an Igbo man, speaking so glowingly about uh, this person from the northeastern part of Nigeria, I said, this is how it should be. And let a Hausa man get up and speak glowingly about Michael Para or uh, Ujuku or whatever. And let a Yoruba man get up and speak. This is how it should be because if we really face the fact, we all have the good, the bad, and the ugly in our villages. And some of our best benefactors are often not from our village. We know that in our sober moments, isn't it? But when some, when some manipulators come to us and say that it is because of our tribe that this, then we follow them foolishly. To that extent, what is Mary saying to us? Mary is saying, be wise, be sensible, so that you may breathe. Don't allow people who are putting their legs on your neck don't allow them to succeed. Now, I have a message for today. Nigeria's 63rd Independence Day celebration, where do we go from here? First, the consecration of Nigeria to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Today, we celebrate the solemnity of Mary, Queen of Nigeria. At Independence on October 1, 1960, the Catholic bishops of Nigeria dedicated the new country to the patronage of Blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus, pleading that she, who is crowned Queen of Heaven, will, as Queen of Nigeria, perpetually intercede for the unity, the peace, the security, 
and the prosperity of our country. Nigeria was again consecrated to the Blessed Virgin Mary on February 14, 1982 at a ceremony in Kaduna during the first visit of St. John Paul II. Thus, we recognize the Blessed Virgin Mary as the primary patron of Nigeria and celebrate the feast on October 1 each year. And we recognize St. Patrick, whose feast we celebrate on March 17, uh, as the secondary patron of Nigeria. Now, I want to give you excerpts from the statement issued by the Bishops' Conference of Nigeria. On October 1, 1960, the Catholic bishops issued a joint pastoral letter titled, The Catholic Church in Independent Nigeria. They described the moment as one in which joy floods the hearts of the people of Nigeria, saying that the church joins in the independent celebrations with the splendor and solemnity of her liturgy. This is what we're doing today. However, from day one, October 1, 1960, the bishops already recognized that, quote, for some years to come, we shall have to face problems that arise from the great size of the country and from the diversity of the people. They noted that, I quote, there is grave danger that some groups more concerned for personal power and more, and more concerned for personal power and interest than for the good of the country, they will seek to exploit ethnic differences for their own selfish ends. This is 1960. And they warned that, quote, no Catholic can, with a good conscience, indulge in a policy that sets one section of the state against another. In other words, no Catholic should be found guilty of what they called tribalism. On the institution of social justice and equity in the country, the bishops stated as follows in the Independence Day statement. Quote, much of our progress can be achieved by only through making sacrifices and maintaining integrity. Those who lead in political and economic activities must take care not to let the gap between people become greater still. We should not let the gap between people become greater. Discontent may easily grow if luxury is flaunted before the eyes of the people who believe that they have not enough to live on decently. Moreover, they said, senior civil servants, take note, the excessive distinction between senior and junior workers in the civil service that we have inherited from the colonial days cannot be allowed to continue. Salaries and allowances that were meant to attract expatriates, personnel from abroad, cannot be maintained in a society that intends to have a fair share out of its natural resources. This is 1960. Furthermore, the bishops warned that, quote, in the course of industrialization of the country, we shall avoid creating conditions under which vast masses of poorly paid or unemployed laborers live in our cities in desperately bad housing conditions. We at least have the opportunity to avoid the mistakes of the Industrial Revolution in Europe and elsewhere. And on the critical place of leadership integrity for national development, the bishops insisted that, I quote, the key to Nigeria's future lies especially in the hands of her leaders. To face the enormous challenges ahead, we need leaders who will seek the good of the nation as a whole and who will put the nation before the good of a particular grouping or class or their own personal good. We need leaders who are dedicated men and women in national and international affairs, our leaders will command respect in the degree to which they manifest integrity in their deeds. Finally, 
reflecting on the real essence of independence for the generality of the people, they said, and I quote, we want a proper standard of living for our people because freedom to go hungry or freedom to be unhealthy is not freedom at all. We want economic freedom because without it, political freedom is illusory and empty. We want more and better education so that our people may have freedom of intellect and the possibility of realizing their cultural aspirations. We want freedom in our personal lives because freedom has to find ultimate expression on the level of the individual person. We want the freedom for our people that means living lives of virtue because sin is the greatest of servitudes. We want, above all, freedom to serve God because his truth alone makes us supremely free. These are words from the Catholic bishops in 1960. By the way, by then, there were only 19 of them. And today, we have over 70 of them. The Nigerian precarious circumstances. Today, we celebrate the 63rd anniversary of our independence amidst heightened political tension, widespread insecurity, worsening economic fortunes, a barrage of litigations in our courts after the very contentious 2023 general elections, and an unprecedented crisis of legitimacy and credibility, as well as trust deficits regarding many of the personalities that run our public affairs. In these unfortunate circumstances, those of us who have not given up on Nigeria, those of us who still have faith in and are committed to the emergence of a better country, must start asking those occupying positions of power at all levels in our country the following questions. And yes, we owe it a duty to ask them, what does it mean to belong to Nigeria, really? What really are the fundamental basis of our corporate existence as a nation? What do we hold in common as Nigerians? What do we agree should be our core national values? What are the basic rules of engagement for our common union? What is the life of a poor Nigerian worth before the government? Is there really a social contract between the people and their elected or appointed leaders? And does the Nigerian state owe the people anything the Nigerian nation has been the cause of untold pain and distress and trauma for millions of innocent women, men, and children who have been rendered incapable of achieving their potential in life simply because they were born in Nigeria and not in Senegal or in Botswana. Many have had their hope of optimal flourishing dashed and their dream of wholesome existence aborted due to what has come to be known as the Nigerian factor. Millions of men, women, and children perish in the senseless fratricidal war we fought between 1967 and 1970. Millions more have been dispatched to their early graves by terrorist insurgents, killer bandits, so-called unknown gunmen, armed robbers, kidnappers, and other criminals. Many have had their precious lives wasted at the hands of trigger-happy security agents who were equipped with guns and paid to secure the lives of innocent Nigerians. Others have faced untimely death because of the absence of modern health facilities and critical emergency services that are to taken for granted in other climes. Some of these victims of crime and neglect cried and wailed until they breathed their last but they got no help from the Nigerian government that is constitutionally obligated to guarantee their safety. Yes, for many, it has been a tale of woe, of broken promises, and of dashed hopes. It is therefore clear to many thinking compatriots that the Nigerian state as presently constituted is not working for most people in this territory. If the National Bureau of Statistics agrees that over 130 million Nigerians are living in what they call multidimensional poverty, 
at a time when our country brandishes the highest number of billionaires in Africa, and if indeed a land so richly endowed by the Almighty God could allow itself to become the poverty capital of the world, then obviously the Nigerian state is not working for the overwhelming majority of the people. As we mark the 63rd anniversary of our independence from British colonial rule, I join other Nigerian individuals and pressure groups who have been advocating for a renegotiation of the terms and conditions of our union as a matter of utmost urgency and priority national imperative. This, to me, is the most viable path for salvaging our failing and collapsing nation. The changes we require. The changes we require to bring about are not superficial, but massive, fundamental, and far-reaching. For Nigeria to work, and for our national fortunes to be radically transformed, the changes we require to bring about are not superficial, but massive, I say. Yet, in my view, these changes that we must urgently bring about can be summarized under three broad themes. One, rule of law. We must build a nation where law and order reign and dispense with the widespread culture of impunity, gangsterism, and executive lawlessness, which has brought us to the deplorable state of the jungle, where life is nasty, brutish, and short, and where only the most corrupt, the most ruthless, and the most beastly among us are surviving in the short term. Two, equal citizenship. Nigerians of all ethnic, religious, and social backgrounds, as well as political affiliations, must be accorded equal opportunities in every sector of our national life. We must be made to feel that we are all included in the management of our commonwealth. We cannot continue with the exploitative and scandalous situation whereby 95% of the resources of our country are in the hands of less than 5% of the population who can send their children to expensive private schools and universities at home and abroad, and who regularly travel abroad for medical treatment while abandoning public education and public health care to a state of utter decay. We cannot continue with the situation whereby the children of my driver and my security guard will become drivers and security guards for my own children because they had no opportunity for good education. No, we must provide equal opportunities for all Nigerian children so that the children of nobody today can become somebody tomorrow without knowing anybody. Furthermore, we must embrace equal citizenship and throw away the anomaly that we call indigenship, whereby a child born and bred in Okene, Kogi State, can live there all his life, work and pay taxes there, and he can still be denied some of the basic rights and privileges of the citizen of Kogi State, simply because his ancestors migrated from elsewhere in the country, and they had a different religion or spoke a different language. A measure of self-determination or devolution of powers. We must immediately engage in the radical restructuring of our nation and trace our steps back to the Federalist route negotiated by the Founding Fathers and not continue to run a military-style unitary system and yet claim that we are a federal republic, a situation where governors every day, every month are running to Abuja to collect allocation is most undesirable. And a situation where local government chairmen are running to the governor to collect percentages of their allocation is most undesirable. We must understand that the basis of the existence of Nigeria is mutual respect for the religious, ethnic, cultural, and social diversities of the people in the Union. The 1999 Constitution appears to have vested too much power in the center and emasculating the federating units. This constitutional blunder is tearing us apart and killing us, and therefore, those impositions of power in the executive, legislative, and judicial arms of government must be pressured into immediately setting in motion the constitutional processes for rectifying these anomalies. 
we must cut down drastically on the cost of governance. The economic realities of today challenge us to adopt no more than six or seven viable regions or states and grant those regions or states a good measure of self-determination, thereby reducing to the barest minimum the items on the exclusive legislative list. There are still self-serving people today calling for more states, I hope you know calling for more local government and more states when the states are not viable and the local governments are not viable. They are self-serving. They don't have the interest of Nigerians at heart. We must cut down massively on the cost of governance by merging ministries, departments, and agencies in a more radical manner than the Oronsaye report recommended. I consider it utterly insensitive. I consider it ridiculous. I consider it bizarre that at a time when Nigerians are groaning in dehumanizing poverty and destitution, the present administration will be creating more ministries, appointing more ministers, and providing more jobs for the boys in the name of special advisors and personal assistants. Such is an insult to the sensibilities of the Nigerian people. And thinking Nigerians, all thinking Nigerians should wake up to say no to such reckless brigandage coming from government. We must cut down drastically on the pecs or material benefits for public office holders to make public office less attractive for those who have no vocation for leadership or any sense of service for the common good, but who are only seeking to control the keys to the national treasury. addressing the religious question. We must now summon the courage to discuss openly and frankly the thorny issues of religion and state of origin. We must agree on what role, if any, religious should play in governance and resolve on whether we want to live under a monarchical theocracy of some sort or we want to live together as a modern federal, democratic, multi-ethnic and multi-religious entity founded on the principles of justice and equity and equality and mutual respect. If we are not able to resolve these stony issues once and for all, then I fear that this country may not survive as one corporate entity for much longer because, quite frankly, as presently constituted, I see that time is running out for Nigeria. We are sitting on a keg of gunpowder on a time bomb. Thus, as we mark our 63rd Independence Day, amidst a myriad of existential problems, including an unprecedented economic recession, resulting in massive devaluation of the life of ordinary Nigerians, and a looming general strike by the labor unions with the attendant tension across the land, I urge all of you who have not given up on the Nigerian project to challenge the present occupiers of public office at all levels, from local government to the presidency of the country, to do something quickly to alleviate the intense suffering in the land and address the fundamental cracks in our national policy, or they should resign their positions and let other people try. The primary purpose of government is the welfare, the safety, and the security of the citizens of the country. But the party in power has been giving us excuses since 2015. We must let them know that we have no more time for any further excuses. As our children are being abducted in droves by killer bandits, as security agents are being decimated in their numbers, and as the modern day slavery, and as, uh, and as, as there is modern day slavery, our children are being sold to modern day slavery. And as many distressed and frustrated persons, unfortunately, are now taking their own lives in a new wave of suicidality. We are quite frankly sitting on a keg of gunpowder or a ticking time bomb. The ship of state is sinking. We are bleeding from every part of our corporate body. To say that Nigeria is experiencing state failure is an understatement. We are on the verge of an imminent implosion or state collapse. And unless something drastic is done very quickly to ameliorate the situation, we shall end up where we are headed and it is not a good place. Sadly, the Nigerian political elite 
including those superintending our affairs today, has consistently demonstrated its utter lack of capacity to steer the ship away from turbulent waters towards peace and prosperity. They have failed woefully in the critical task of forging a united people from the disparate ethnic groups that populate this territory. Instead, they have callously exploited the historical or primitive ethnic and religious sentiments and antipathies among the people for selfish political and economic gain. And the Nigerian leadership conundrum has been further compounded by the very embarrassing, embarrassingly ominous question of identity, integrity, and credibility that surround a number of those who today superintend our local, state, and national affairs. Righteousness exalts a nation. We read in Proverbs 14, 34, that righteousness exalts a nation, but that sin is a reproach to any people. In Proverbs 29, 2, we read that when the righteous are in power, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, the people groan. Yes. Proverbs 29, 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, the people groan. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 4 says, it is justice, it is by justice that a king gives stability to the land. It is by justice that a king gives stability to the land. And in Proverbs 29, 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Some translations render the verse as, where there is no leadership integrity, the people do perish. What this means is that leadership integrity is fundamental and critical to national development, to national unity, and national peace and prosperity. This is very well illustrated in the history of Israel. When they had good leaders, Good God-fearing leaders like Joshua, like David, like Hezekiah, like Josiah, like Joseph, Jehoshaphat, like Nehemiah and Ezra, they conquered their enemies, they experienced restoration, and they enjoyed peace and prosperity. But when they had leaders who lacked integrity and the fear of God, like Saul, like Jeroboam, like Ahab, like Nadab, you remember Ahab, the husband of Jezebel, when they had those kind of leaders, they were easily defeated by their enemies, by enemy forces. In one case, Israel was not only conquered by their adversaries, they were enslaved and deported to Babylon for 70 years. And to illustrate the point further, there is this report in the book of Ecclesiasticus, Sirach, chapter 47, verse 23 to 25, that I quote, Solomon rested with his ancestors, meaning he died, leaving one of his stock, one of his children, as his successor. And he described that child as the stupidest member of the nation. Are you hearing? The stupidest member of the nation, brainless Rehoboam, whose policy drove the nation to rebel. Next, Rehoboam's son, Rehoboam, son of uh, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who made Israel to commit sin and set Ephraim on the way of evil. From then on, it says, their sins multiplied exceedingly as to drive them out of their country, and they tried out every kind of wickedness until vengeance overtook them. It begins from who? Leader. It begins from leadership without integrity. Recall that, as is recorded in the 12th chapter of the book of Kings, it was this Rehoboam who succeeded his father Solomon as king of Israel and Judah. When he ascended the throne, the elders of Israel went to him. You remember that David united the two kingdoms of Israel and Judah. The elders went to him and complained about how hard life had been under King Solomon, his father, saying, your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, we beg you, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke that he placed on us 
and we will serve you. Just lighten our burden. His counselors, Rehoboam's counselors, advised him on how to respond to the elders with compassion. But he disregarded the advice of his counselors, and instead he told the elders that, I quote, My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with bloody chains. When the elders heard the response of King Rehoboam, they resolved to separate themselves from the kingdom of David. So they shouted, To your tents, O Israel. That's the origin. To your tents, O Israel. Look now to your own house, O David. This was the beginning of the disintegration of the kingdom that was united under David and Solomon. The Nigerian state as presently constituted has all the futures of a criminal enterprise. As presently constituted, the Nigerian state has all the features of a criminal enterprise. Yes, Nigeria is today being run in the form of an organized crime. We have fumbled and blundered along for 63 years, most of which have been under misguided military adventurists, punitive overlords, and clueless usurpers of political power. But we cannot survive for much longer as a corporate entity, let alone prosper in unity and peace, or take our rightful place in the Committee of Nations under a bunch of scoundrels. We cannot prosper under a syndicate of gangsters or under a cabal of criminals. Some of them are known to have used the state's instrument of coercion to shut down the voices of dissent. Some of them are known to have sponsored terrorists and killer bandits that have continued to wreak havoc in major parts of the country. Some of them are known to have, re to have recruited the so-called unknown government to cause mayhem here and there in the polity. Some of them are known to have regularly mobilized drunken thugs and violent cultists to assassinate or intimidate their political opponents. And some of them are known to have looted staggering amounts from the nation's treasury riding exotic cars with police escort, living in palatial mansions, owning expensive properties abroad where they often settle with their families while abandoning the generality of the people to dehumanizing multidimensional poverty and misery. Now, what measure of progress can Nigeria possibly make in our journey towards nationhood? as long as we remain saddled and burdened with such a syndicate of criminals superintending the affairs of our nation? What measure of progress can we possibly make in our aspirations for national development so long as we remain constricted and entrapped by the conspiracy of treasury looters, election riggers, hanging around the corridors of power? What measure of progress can we make towards national unity, peace, and prosperity as long as we remain plagued and afflicted by greedy merchants of money and prostitutes of power whose consciences are deadened and who are therefore devoid of any ethical or moral scruples. N nations are built on fundamental values. And as long as those values are not there, we cannot make progress. As we celebrate Independence Day amidst embarrassing crises of integrity and credibility, on the part of many public officers, I wish to highlight the fact that nations are built primarily and fundamentally on values and not on material resources. Otherwise, if it was just material resources, Singapore and Japan would have been in the league of the poorest nations in the world. But nations are built on values. The value of truth, the value of justice, the value of honesty, the value of integrity. That's what builds nations. Go and ask Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore. Our readings are focused on leadership integrity. Our readings of today, the readings selected for today. We Catholics in Nigeria mark this Independence Day, with the celebration of the Solemnity of Mary, Queen of Nigeria, the readings chosen for today are principally on leadership integrity or godly leadership. What God desires is that the leader of his people would govern with holiness and righteousness 
and judge the people with integrity, resulting in such peaceful, blissful, and glorious dispensation that, quote, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion will, f and the fatling, that they will feed together. With the righteous leadership envisaged by Isaiah, the cow and the bear will graze together, and the young will lie down together. And I will end with a word on the judiciary. I want to remind our senior lawyers and judges the words of St. Augustine, 4th century mystic and writer, which says, kingdoms devoid of justice are nothing but a bunch of bandits or a gang of robbers. Can we say that together? Kingdoms devoid of justice are nothing but a bunch of bandits or a gang of robbers. Nigerian judges ought to constantly beware of the manipulation of the technicalities of the law to ensure the dispensation of substantial justice in our courts. This is because the confidence the people repose on judges is what constitutes the foundation of the court system. It will be a tragic situation if some judges are suspected of yielding their moral authority to political influence. When there is the growing impression that smart lawyers are increasingly able to persuade juries to exploit the technicalities of the law to exonerate corrupt rulers, rogue politicians, and greedy business tycoons, then we will begin to set the stage and lay the foundation for the coming anarchy or the revenge of the poor. And it should be noted that such revenge of the poor will not spare lawyers and judges, as well as bishops and priests who in our society are seen to belong to the privileged elite class. The French Revolution of 1792 to 1802 should continue to be taken as a bloody reminder of what dire consequences all of us who belong to the elite class will face if we do not change our course today and show greater commitment to upholding and defending the fundamental and inalienable rights of the human being, of every human being. And I will end by praying that the mother of Jesus will indeed speak to her son today and say, my children in Nigeria have run out of wine. Do something for them. And as she speaks to her son, she will turn to us and say, do whatever he tells you. May we have the attention of mind to do whatever the Lord Jesus tells us. On this note, I wish you happy Independence Day. Let us rise. I believe in one God.
Sisters and brothers, as we celebrate our mother Mary as queen and patroness of Nigeria, let us ask for her maternal intercession for a just, united, and peaceful nation. For the leaders of the church, that in the face of the distressing situation of our country, they may be agents of justice, peace, and positive transformation. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the leaders of our country, that the Lord may protect them from all harm and fill them with the wisdom they need to be able to improve the living conditions of the people. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the citizens of our nation, that they may cooperate with the government in those matters that aid the building of a just, united, and peaceful society. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For married couples experiencing difficulties in their relationship, that through the help of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who, who came to the rescue of the couple at the wedding at Cana, they may find a lasting solution to their problems. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord For the dead, especially those of our parish community and family members, that they may find eternal rest with the Lord. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord hear For the success of the evangelization and leadership development programs of the Luxterra Leadership Foundation and for the intentions of its partners and benefactors. We pray, O oh Lord. Let us now pray in silence for our private intentions. We pray, O oh Lord. Let us ask for the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary as we pray. Hail Mary. Let us pray. Lord God, as we celebrate the consecration of Nigeria to the Blessed Virgin Mary, we pray that through her intercession, God may answer our prayers and our land may know lasting peace and prosperity. Through Christ our Lord. 